Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we're two minutes into the hour. So good morning or afternoon or evening for everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for the sixth session of the ISPD Virtual Education Series. My name is Kelly Chen. I'm a genetic counselor here in California in the United States, and I'll be moderating today's webinar along with my genetic counselor, SIG coach chair, Katie Ellis, who is in Australia. We'll be hearing from genetic counselors, Sylvia Mann and Zoe Milgram, who will be giving presentations on genetic counseling and telehealth. Before we get started, I have a few announcements to share. If you need technical assistance, please use the chat function for support. Throughout the presentation, you could submit questions for the presenter in the Q&A function. We'll address these at the end of the session. You can use the thumbs up button to vote for the questions you like the most, which will push them higher up the question list. You may also choose to raise your hand to ask a question and the moderator may call on you. Statements expressed by the presenters are those of the participants individually and do not represent the opinion of the International Society for Prenatal Diagnosis. This event is being recorded. If you do not wish to be recorded, do not raise your hand to speak or submit a question to the Q&A. So now let's go ahead and start off with a couple of Zoom polls. Hopefully you should see these popping up on your screen. So let me read this for those of you who may not be able to see it. Uh, we're just asking what your role is, whether you're a physician, a genetic counselor, or other healthcare provider. Okay, it looks like we have a, a majority of people who voted in. So we have, it looks like 45% of our audience are genetic counselors, 39% are physicians, and 15% are other. So thank you for that. And let's look at the second question. How often are you using telehealth to provide healthcare services? Okay, thank you for most of you answering this. It looks like 46% uh, of you say frequently uh, you're providing telehealth services, 11% say moderately, 14% occasionally, and 29% rarely. It's very interesting. Great, so thank you for, for those background, uh, the background um, on who the audience is. It helps us to know this for the speakers. So now I'd like to go ahead and introduce you to our first uh, speaker for today. Sylvia Mann is a board certified genetic counselor who has worked in the Hawaii Department of Health since 1993. She's the project director for the Health Resources and Services Administration funded Western States Regional Genetics Network or WSRGN. To improve access and education, Ms. Mann has been working on increasing the use of telegenetics since 2004 by developing and implementing a telegenetics training course for genetics providers across the United States. Ms. Mann chairs the National Coordinator Center for the Regional Genetics, Networks, Regional genetics Network Telegenetics Workgroup and has served on many national, regional, and local genetics committees. She received her Bachelor of Science degree from the University of British Columbia and her master's of science degree in human genetics and genetic counseling from Sarah Lawrence College. I'd like to now pass it over to Sylvia. Thank you, Kelly. Just going to pop up my slides here. So, okay. So aloha everybody. Thank you very much for asking me to speak on a topic that has been top of mind during the pandemic for sure. <laughs> so first of all, disclosures, I have no commercial interest because I am a state government employee and that would be against our code of ethics for state government employees. Um, our telegenetics activities, some of them are funded by our federal grant um, under the Western States Regional Genetics Network. So an overview of what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk a little bit about 
definition so that we're all on the same page. Um, challenges and opportunities for telehealth. What's the future of our telegenetics? Um, re I'm gonna give you resources so that after my talk, you can actually go look at the resources at your leisure. And then um, at the end of the session after Zoe talks, we'll have questions and discussion. So let's start first with telehealth definitions. So when we first started this, people were like telehealth versus telemedicine, because telemedicine was still very much a term that was used. I think now people have mostly switched over to telehealth. So um, as defined by the International Organization for Standardization. So there actually is an organization that standardizes terms. So telehealth is the use of telecommunication techniques for the purpose of providing telemedicine, medical education, and health education over a distance. So telehealth is more than just providing clinical services. Telemedicine is defined as the use of advanced telecommunication technologies to exchange health information and provide healthcare services across geographic time, social, and cultural barriers. So telemedicine is a more limited definition than telehealth. But really, nowadays, people use a lot of these terms interchangeably. The other part about telehealth is that we have the originating site. The originating site is where your patient is. So they are the origin of the telehealth visit. Your distant site is where the telehealth provider is located. So that is the distant site. I know that sometimes healthcare providers feel that we are the center of the world and we should be the originating site, but we are the distant site for telehealth. And then we talk about modalities, the way the telehealth service is provided to the patient. So we have two types of modalities really, synchronous, which is real time, so most of us are used to, like right now, are doing Zoom, uh, live video conferencing that includes video and audio. Some of us are doing e-consults, which is a health provider to health provider live synchronous consult. And then um, during COVID-19, at least in the United States, because we know that some people don't have access to the video part of the telehealth visit, telephone only telehealth has been allowed uh, during the pandemic under emergency protocols. There's also asynchronous modalities. So most of us might be used to something called store and forward. Radiologists use store and forward a lot. An x-ray is taken in a site, uploaded to a secure server, or encrypted in an email to the radiologist. The radiologist can then look at the x-ray in uh, their time that they devote to looking at x-rays, come up with the uh, reading of the x-ray and then send back the result in a report to the uh, center that did the x-ray. This is very common, storm forward. Another um, asynchronous model is remote patient monitoring. So sometimes patients can be wearing devices, the information is uploaded to uh, a file, and then um, either the patient can press a button and then the file goes to the healthcare provider or the healthcare provider can go and extract the information to look and see what the data is on monitoring that patient. Things that were, have not been supported as telehealth modalities are emails, uh, text messaging, and faxing. Now, this is not to say that somehow in the future it won't be supported as telehealth, especially for things like ordering medications and, and things like that. But right now, that isn't under um, a definition of tele providing telehealth. So if you're going to text message somebody, that isn't um, what someone would be like saying that that is a telehealth visit. So there has been rapid expansion of telehealth during COVID-19. Um, this is our experience is that first of all, the healthcare providers ran to us and said, what are the billing and reimbursement um, things? Because we want to get paid for not seeing patients in our office. So that was the first thing they asked us. Um, and there was rapid changes. And I think that at the beginning of the pandemic, changes were happening almost on a daily basis in the US system for um, how you can bill and get reimbursed for the services. I'm sure that that was also some of the things that were happening in other countries too, because no, 
there was no time in the past where everybody moved to doing telehealth so rapidly than during the start of the pandemic. After they figured out that they actually could get bill uh, reimbursed for the services, and then they started asking, well, how do I get started with this? What equipment do I need? What platforms? What planning? Um, how do I set up my office? Things like that. And then we started talking about provider and patient resources. Um, what are what can I do to learn about best practices to provide services through telehealth? Because I'm not used to staring at a computer screen or, or knowing what to do on camera. Um, and then of course they said our patients are having problems because they don't know how to log on their computer and, and what do they need to do? So making provider and patient resources was the next thing. Then um, of course, as people started to get more comfortable then making uh, better clinical workflows because at the beginning it was like a mad scramble and then after they started getting settled down then it was like okay we actually have to do a formalized clinical workflow so things can flow more smoothly and then unfortunately although this is the thing that I love the most is evaluation finally we were able to say okay now that you are actually calm and you have a good clinical workflow let's talk about collecting data so that we can make sure that we have that data to back up your services later on after the pandemic if you want to continue telehealth so challenges and opportunities for telehealth so the good part is that you can use lots of different devices to do telehealth um, it's available to both you as a provider and also to your patients. Um, the challenge is that not everybody has the devices. So um, we gave a uh, talk to the Northern California Genetic Counselors recently, and uh, we were told that a medical center as rich as Stanford Medical Center had not been providing devices or did not have devices available for their genetics um, providers as they were doing telehealth. So they had to actually use the personal devices. So even though providers might have more resources, you have to think that your patients, if a provider is having trouble getting resources like devices, then your patient is going to have some challenges getting devices too. The good part is that there are many different devices that can be used. So it isn't like the old days. I remember in 2004, our first telecom machine was a Polycom and it cost me $15,000 for our site. And then I had to buy another machine for the originating site on, um, on Maui, uh, which also cost me $15,000. So that's $30,000 just for the equipment. Nowadays for that $30,000, I could buy devices for a lot of people. So it is a lot easier nowadays. So the other things um, that can be a challenge um, or an opportunity is all these accessories that you can get. Now um, for genetic counseling, at least, uh, we find that very uh, useful accessories are noise canceling headphones uh, because it takes away that background noise uh, uh, that you have. Sometimes if you're doing a consult with more than one person in the room, if there's more than one provider, having a noise canceling speaker is good. This one is a Jabra noise canceling speaker. We like it because when it's on mute, there are lights around the outside that light up red. And when it's active, the lights light up green. Anybody that has misspoken when there is a live microphone on, or said some things that you didn't realize the live microphone is on, will appreciate the lights. Because if you are in a room with more than one provider talking to a patient, you wanna know when your mic is on and when it's off. So those red lights, when it's off, it's muted, is, are, those lights are lovely. <laughs> so you know that you're not saying things that the other side can hear. The other things that we use um, for our genetic counseling purposes are we use a document reader or um, if you don't want to spend uh, money for the document reader, this is a portable document reader. It costs us about $200 US. You can also put a webcam on a little tripod so that uh, the webcam is about 35, tripod is about $20. And that is to help you share your counseling aids. Like if you want to draw out a pedigree, you want to show your patient, you want to draw out inheritance pattern, you have 
pictures of something you want to show the other side, a document reader is really nice. The other part is that, let's say you draw a pedigree, the document reader can take a picture of it, and then that can be uploaded to the electronic medical record or put into, uh, printed out and put into the patient's chart. So, so we love our document readers um, for um, our genetic counseling sessions. The other thing, now, you can spend a lot of money doing telehealth. There are tons of peripherals that you can add to telehealth sessions. And one thing um, that is really cool is this portable ultrasound that looks like it attaches to a tablet, um, which then can be uh, shared with the specialist on the other end of that um, connection. Uh, you can have scales, you can do pulse oximeters, you can do otoscopes. There are so many peripherals that you can add to your telehealth visit. And it depends on what you're going to do. If you're just going to do a, a risk assessment counseling session, you don't need peripherals. But let's say you have a patient on the other end and you do want some exam and you do have someone who is skilled to help with the exam, you could have lots of different peripherals on that side to help. Um, we have uh, one really loved uh, general exam scope. It is a general exam camera. Unfortunately, it is expensive. It's like $5,000 US. But when you use it, the picture, the actual picture that's transmitted is so, so good. And if you're doing exam where you're looking at dysmorphology or you're looking at skin or something, pictures are just beautiful. So there are a lot of things that you can do. Of course, if you don't have money, that is a challenge because then you won't have that many peripherals to be able to use. The other um, thing is that besides all the equipment, the platform. So in the US, we have the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. In other countries, you also have different laws for health um, information protection. So our, for us, we look at whether things are HIPAA compliant. Are they compliant with the rules about keeping health information private? So we have lots of HIPAA compliant applications, Zoom, Video, WebEx, Doximi, Doximity. There's lots of different platforms. Um, those are the ones that we usually use pre-pandemic and also during the pandemic. Now, people realize that during the pandemic, not everybody has access to these video platforms because they cost money. Um, although you can get uh, some free time on each one, it's not as convenient as having the paid version where you can have unlimited time. So in the United States, they have allowed using Skype and FaceTime during the COVID-19 crisis to do telehealth with your patients. There's also lots of platforms that are not recommended. Um, I'm, I don't know how many people have watched TikTok videos of dancing and things like that. So TikTok, Twitch, and Facebook Live would not be, um, they're more open to the public. So they're not exactly recommended as platforms you use for telehealth. So patient-specific challenges that we found um, after doing telehealth during this pandemic um, and before are that patients lack devices and internet and cellular connections. Now, um, even though we've been working really hard to try to get devices to people, and then in Hawaii, our Department of Education um, as in other jurisdictions, have been handing out um, laptops to students with hotspots um, so that they can do their schoolwork. Well, our Department of Education also said, hey, if you have those devices with the hotspots, those families are allowed to use them for telehealth if they, they um, need to, as long as it doesn't interfere with the child's work. So you shouldn't be like ripping the laptop away from a child doing homework um, to do your telehealth appointment, but they're um, able to be used for that. We also have other creative um, solutions such as uh, in Hawaii, we have a lot of tour buses usually because we have a lot of tourists. Well, during the pandemic, we don't have that many tourists. So um, those tour buses have Wi-Fi on them. And for the education system, they've taken those buses and created uh, 
tour bus hotspot. So they will park in areas where we know that there's many families that don't have internet connections and the students can sit around the bus, not inside the bus, around the bus, uh, socially distanced and be able to connect to the Wi-Fi. Now, our, what we're working on is another idea where we take those same tour buses and we take all the seats out of the tour bus and we set up a table, chair, and um, a laptop computer with some device, other peripherals, and make that a telehealth uh, hub. So we would uh, have our community health worker on the bus. The bus driver would drive it to an area that we knew had families that didn't necessarily have good uh, devices or internet connections. And then we would have scheduled telehealth appointments where the community health worker would be able to bring the people on the bus to do the telehealth session, clean the area in between patients. Um, so those are some of the creative ideas in trying to get uh, beyond the challenges for the patients. Um, we also have complaints by patients that every doctor uses a different platform. And unfortunately that's true. Sometimes you have no choice because your health uh, organization, your hospital says, we will use XYZ platform. And then the other hospital that has your other doctor says, no, no, we're going to use this other platform. Well, sometimes the platforms require different registration by the patients and the patients are super confused. Well, I'll have to say the doctors are also super confused, but the patients are super confused because they have to register in this system and then somehow get a link to get on and then they have to register another system, get another link to get on, and they're already having enough problems trying to figure out how to get on, but you're telling them to do all this extra work too. The other big problem that of course we're facing is digital literacy. Not everybody knows how to use computers and not everybody knows how to log on to a system or get your email so you can get the link to go on the telehealth platform. So we are really dealing with a community of people that we have found really have no or low digital literacy. And we're trying to say, this is how you're gonna get your healthcare. That is not gonna work well. So we are really trying hard to figure out how we can help navigate families and patients how we can provide resources so that families can um, be able to take advantage of telehealth. In um, one of our smaller islands, they have a project with high school students who are in a health professions program. So these are students that have expressed interest in becoming a healthcare professional. They are being trained on the different platforms and they will be going out to help the seniors in their community actually log on to their doctor's appointments through telehealth and help them figure out how to get their appointments through telehealth. So this is one of the solutions that we're looking at to help people who have lower digital literacy. So the other challenge of course is follow-up. Um, when a patient comes to your office, you can order those tests, get the prescription, get your referrals done and do your follow-up appointments. When you're doing telehealth, it does take extra work for you to figure out, are you mailing the test kit to the patient? Are you trying to arrange a test in their area? How are they gonna do that? Is the lab open? Um, you know, what are you gonna do with follow-up appointments? All that stuff is much more difficult when the patient isn't standing in front of you. So I just wanted to go over a little bit of uh, the study that we did in our Western States region about telegenetics. So this is my region, um, Alaska, Washington, Idaho, Oregon, California, Hawaii, um, and Guam, but Guam has no genetics provider. So we asked them to complete, to ask them during pre-COVID and during COVID what their telegenetics practice is. We had about 25% of the providers answer, which is nice because, uh, so that's over 200 providers, um, it's during a pandemic and they're answering a survey. So I was very grateful. Um, so for the providers took the survey, the most um, number of course were genetic counselors. And then we had MD geneticists, and then we had PhD geneticists who providing clinical services. So the survey showed the age of the respondents, um, 20 to 29, 22%. We had 31%, um, 30 to 39. 
and we had 29% 40 to 49. But we also had people that were 50 to 59, and we had people that were 60 plus. So it showed that um, 94 were using telegenetics pre-COVID, 206 were using telegenetics during COVID. Nine were planning to use telegenetics. We did this survey in April. Um, so some nine were still planning and 18 were not using it. And most of them said they weren't using it because the hospital said they can't get paid if they use it telehealth instead of doing in-person sessions. And that's the reason they weren't planning to do telegenetics. So the interesting fact was before COVID-19, 52% of the respondents used telegenetics to deliver less than 40% of their genetic services. After the onset of COVID-19, 82% of respondents reported using telegenetics to deliver 80 to 100% of their genetic services. And that's not surprising because a lot of them weren't allowed to go into their medical centers or their clinics or their offices and see patients in person. So they had to do telegenetics. I've been trying to advocate for telegenetics for the last 16 years and it took a pandemic to make it happen, but it's happening. Types of services provided, um, of course, uh, they had prenatal uh, MD services, adult services, the most were genetic results reporting. We have a lot of big labs in our region. So genetics results reporting by telehealth is not unusual because that's done uh, prior to the pandemic. Adult counseling was mostly cancer counseling, a lot of prenatal counseling, um, some pediatric uh, MD and pediatric counseling and some newborn screening counseling. So I want to end my part by at least leaving you with some telegenetic resources. I understand that you'll have my presentation um, available to you afterwards. So on our Western States website, we have a telegenetics um, section and we have two videos that would be, might be helpful to you. One is that we took our telegenetics training course for genetics providers and quickly made an animated video uh, when the pandemic started. And this takes all the best practice tips and puts it into a five minute video. So if you wanna know best practices, go watch the animated video. We also created a video for patients to, because prior to the pandemic, patients weren't generally receiving telegenetics in their home. They were usually going to a local clinic and then or their primary care provider clinic and getting services. So we made a video to help patients understand how to set up their house um, and be ready for a telegenetics visit. So how to prepare for a telegenetics visit. So that's another animated video. We are updating both videos because uh, we realized in the hurry to make them, we forgot to add the part about if you need an interpreter, please tell your medical provider prior to the appointment so that they can prepare. Uh, we also will be translating the what to expect from a telegenics visit into Spanish, Chinese, Tagalog, Vietnamese, um, Korean, uh, American Sign Language, and Samoan um, as part of another project that we're doing. There's a, a bunch of telegenetics resources for patients, checklists and things like that. There's a lot of resources for providers, your best practice documents, how to set up a telehealth system, legal and policy issues, mostly for the US though, but I'm sure that you can translate them into whatever laws you have in your country. We have some sample telehealth consent forms because under some state laws in the US, you have to have consent to do telehealth, which is separate from your regular consent, or you have to add it into your regular consent. And of course, my favorite, evaluation forms. Um, we have provider evaluation forms, patient evaluation forms. I have to tell you that in all the years I've done telehealth, we have always had such high patient satisfaction um, that our evaluator told us to stop collecting that data because no patient ever says they hate telehealth. So um, I think that I, was able to complete in the time. Yay, there's my time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sylvia, for that presentation. So before we introduce our next speaker, we'd like to do a couple of polls again. So the first poll we'll launch onto your screen is about the level of experience you have with telehealth, expert, skilled, learning, or none. 
So we'll just give you a couple of seconds to answer. Fantastic, so about half of you have, have answered um, and 47% say that they're learning um, telehealth, 33% uh, say they're skilled with telehealth, 8% say they are expert with telehealth and 12% say they have no experience at all. So thank you for those answers. And then we'll launch a final poll about what is your biggest challenge in telehealth services? So a couple of choices there, if you could take a moment, please. Okay, great. So approximately 40% of you say the, the biggest challenge is the patient access issues. 27% uh, say it's difficult due to limited physical examination. 23% say it's difficult due to limited interactions and communications by video. And 10% say the biggest challenge is the provider connection issues. So thank you very much. With those issues in mind, I would like to introduce our second speaker, Zoe Milgram. Zoe is an accredited genetic counsellor with over a decade of experience working in both the public and private health sectors in Australia. In 2018, she co-founded Eugene Labs to increase access to clinical genetic testing by providing a new service delivery model to support the well-established tertiary clinical genetic services and satisfy the increasing demand for the proactive clinical grade genetic testing. So uh, we look forward to hearing Zoe's presentation. Thank you. Just wanna check that you can hear me okay. Yes, thank you, Zoe. And just checking you can see my presentation. I assume that's a yes. Good morning, everybody, for those of you in the Southern Hemisphere and good afternoon or good evening for those dialing in from the North. Um, as Katie mentioned, my name is Zoe Milgram and I'm a genetic counsellor and also a founder of Eugene Labs. And the opinions are definitely those expressed by our company. Um, and I hope to provide you a lot of uh, information about how we've developed a purely digital clinical genetic service. We've been uh, functioning since October 2018. And since that time, we've seen over 4,000 people. So thank you so much for inviting me to speak to you all today. And I think before COVID-19, most of us would say that telehealth was definitely seen as a second best option to face-to-face -face consultations. I hope after my presentation today, you'll feel more confident about offering telehealth as part of your healthcare offering and see the enormous benefits it can offer. A big thanks to Sylvia for setting me up with a lot of background, but I'll just summarize some key takeaways and then move on to some more counseling issues. So in terms of important considerations when establishing a telehealth service, it's really important to remember that clear communication of complex information is really, really achievable, particularly if we put a lens of compassion and inclusion in the way we speak and the language that we use. So today I'm gonna to be talking to you about, or summarizing very quickly, uh, what tools you need to provide healthcare online, the key considerations when offering telehealth, the psychosocial differences between face-to-face -face and telehealth appointments, and also some skills you can use and consider when using telehealth for clinical consultation. So when deciding to offer telehealth services, there are a number of basic tools you'll need to have. Firstly, you'll need a video and microphone enabled device. And while my, most laptops these days have these built in, you may like to consider a pair of headphones to improve audio quality or also improve confidentiality, especially if you're working from a shared office space or working from home, which a lot of us are doing at the moment. It's also very important that when discussing private health information that you use secure end-to-end -end encrypted telehealth service software platforms. 
Some excellent examples were shared by Sylvia, but I'd also like to highlight an Australian-based company, CoView, which is incredibly good at simulating a real uh, clinic environment. When moving to a digital clinic, something you might like also to consider is simple integration of your booking systems. This can enable your clinics to choose appointment times or clients to choose appointment times that suit them. I know this is a big shift from traditional services, but it's definitely served us well. It not only cuts down from your admin work and bouncing around between different locations, but it really promotes client autonomy. Other things that you'll need to do is ensure that you have a private room to take calls, good lighting, and of course, a good internet connectivity. I'm tethering today because mine was a bit patchy, but hopefully it holds up. All right, telehealth etiquette. How can you set yourself up for success? Basically, the best thing is to help people be prepared. So providing guidelines to clients in advance is incredibly valuable. You can also use reminder notifications to ensure clients arrive on time. Because people aren't driving to clinics and they're probably in amongst work or homeschooling or running around doing a million other things, that quick 10 minute reminder that you'll be online is a really good way to improve efficiency. It also supports client autonomy to ensure that any software that needs to be downloaded in advance can be done so, reducing stress levels of trying to make their appointment on time. It's really helpful to inform clients about the importance that they take the call from a private space too. Clients often uh, think about telehealth quite differently to attending a clinic and by promoting their understanding of what to expect, it will improve the outcome and, and utility of your sessions. It's really, really helpful to utilize digital forms to collect family history information in advance of your appointments. These services and products are available to help you do this. And I think Sylvia shared some. We've developed our own family history tools that reflect our tone and collect the information that are relevant to our sessions. This information can also then be identified and used for research purposes, provided you have the appropriate um, consents in place. It's really helpful to establish client expectations, as I mentioned, by providing a brief description of what you will cover in the appointment. This lets people also know the duration of the session and inform them of who is required to attend. You can utilize software platforms to create an environment that reflects your service. Some telehealth platforms can be configured to simulate a waiting room. It's possible to have music, share videos, or you may even want to offer a mindfulness activity to help ground and center your clients before their appointments. Lastly, make sure you are on time. If you think that sitting in a waiting room, flicking through old magazines is torturous, Think about what it's like looking at yourself while you're waiting for your clinician to arrive. All right, really importantly, what can we do to build rapport over telehealth? One of the main things that is more difficult to deal with is eye contact during appointments. So ensuring you've familiarised yourself with the client notes prior to the appointment can really help you maintain eye contact and remain engaged with your clients. Collecting family history information in advance saves you clinical time and also enables you to empathize with the experiences of your clients. By supporting the client to share their own history in their own words, you can also gain an insight into the many aspects of their narrative. We've seen a pattern when a person shares minute details about their extended family members. And while these may not be clinically relevant, they help build the family story and lived experience. And you can gain a lot and improve the rapport building by understanding the motivations and intent of your clients. Acknowledging this history goes a really long way to building rapport. So clients can feel instantly validated and heard without you having to have spent the 30 minutes taking down a family history. Something else that you can do is replace waiting room traditions with social norms. Introducing yourself is incredibly important on telehealth because people are not at a hospital. They haven't seen your name on the door. They don't quite know who you are and where you are. 
So informing your clients of your role, what your care is for them and um, what they can expect of you is really, really important for building trust. Small talk can be incredibly genuine. Explore if they're attending the appointment between work tasks. Check in on who else is around them to ensure the client feels comfortable to disclose personal health information to you. And remember that telehealth really evens the playing field. So disclosing something about your own environment goes a long way. For example, I'm in Melbourne, Australia, and until about 10 days ago, we were in strict lockdown with a 5K radius. That meant that when I was seeing a client, it was possible that I was the first person that they were talking to and the only person that they would talk to for that day. So really making sure that you understand where the client's head is at and what else they are experiencing in terms of challenges is incredibly important and invaluable for building rapport. It's really helpful to consider transcribing notes after the session. This improves your capacity to maintain eye contact and also catch any subtle body language clues that your clients are giving you. When providing counselling to couples, it's very, very easy to miss a glance or a supportive hand gesture because you only really get up to here. Um, so consider documenting things afterwards. If you do need to take notes, it's really helpful to let the person know what you're doing. For an example, I work on two screens. So sometimes I'll be looking over here at the patient notes or family history that we've collected. It's really helpful just to let them know what you're doing to make sure they don't think you are distracted by something else. It's also really helpful to know that silences feel incredibly exaggerated, much more so online than in person. Other simple things like making a note of where the person is and um, enabling you to reflect to them and support, uh, explore their supports. So how can you read nonverbal cues? Well, there are three main forms of nonverbal cues, which are eye contact, body language, and the new thing which I've titled unspoken intimacy of telehealth. So nonverbal cues are incredibly important for telehealth model, particularly around genetic counseling. Unlike traditional face-to-face -face sessions where your clients are normally facing you, your clients will also be able to see their partner's reaction to what you or their partner says. This offers a level of transparency, which is not necessarily available in a tr traditional clinical environment. By asking direct questions to reflect your awareness of their responses, you can learn a lot about their perceptions of each other's opinions and vulnerabilities and use these to help the support the client integrating genetic information into their decision making. Eye contact is an important measure of a person's attention. You can also tell a lot about how comfortable they feel, whether they are looking at you or not. We've noticed that clients will often avert their gaze when they are feeling challenged or trying to imagine a scenario playing out. It's really important to acknowledge that quiet silence, especially if they're not looking at the camera because it's likely that they're trying to map out in their head the implications of certain decisions. There are also plenty of limitations when it comes to health, telehealth. And unfortunately, sometimes people may be watching TV during their appointments or doing other things because they feel that they can multitask more easily when it's in a telehealth environment. Don't be uh, shy to suggest to them it might be good to delay what they're doing um, so that they can concentrate or even be a little bit flexible and suggest that they might like to finish what they're doing and you can arrange another time to see them. There are lots of valuable insights when it comes to telehealth and reading nonverbal cues. Clients are typically more open to sharing their vulnerabilities. Glasses of wine are commonly used to calm nerves and we definitely meet a lot of pets who come to their client's aid when they're feeling distressed. You can learn a lot about someone in how they cope with uncertainty or if they're feeling fatigued by how they're sitting. I'm sitting a little bit slunched but forward and this is um, a really important thing for you to think about because if I were to sit here like this to the client that would look incredibly much like I was unengaged and not interested in their, um, in their conversation. 
Observing your client's environment is also really helpful. Many people take telehealth calls from their couch or even from their bed. And because the client chooses their surroundings, you can learn a lot about their relationships as well. It's also important to remember that there is a new code when it comes to how you and your clients dress. It's important for you to look professional, but for many, this may only be from the top up. But it's important to remember that your clients are at home and may attend in pyjamas or sweaty workout gear. This is definitely not a sign of disrespect. It's just the reality of life and lockdown. Alrighty, how can we support informed decision making? This is a really important thing, particularly when it comes to genetics, when informed consent is a really, really big part of how we offer testing. It's important to think about the ways that we can use supplementary technology around telehealth importance. Sylvia spoke a lot about devices in terms of measuring, but we can also use um, intake forms, questionnaires. We can offer pre-shot videos or written information and then refer to these during the appointment. Traditionally, genetic counsellors might allocate up to an hour to each appointment with a client, but telehealth appointments naturally appear to be shorter. This enables the client to see the clinician to see more clients, which is incredibly good. But while we can improve these efficiencies, it can also be incredibly exhausting. And while the many repetitive tasks of education around test, the procedure, risks, benefits, and likely outcomes, we can really lose authenticity in how this information is shared and how the implications of this information is taken on by our clients. We really recommend providing pre-test education outside of the telehealth session. It supports your clients to be more autonomous in their learning. It empowers them to be prepared with questions that are important to them, which enables you to be client-centered and use the face-to-face -face time to focus on building rapport and empowering the client by focusing on their agenda. When it comes to reproductive genetic counselling, which we do a lot of at Eugene, it's important to remember that testing is not always in the best interests of our clients. And so ensuring that you explore the client's choice and take time to discuss the potential implications of those choices, this can be incredibly empowering to support your client to make informed choices that align with their values and belief systems. Consistency of care tends to be even more important when it comes to telehealth. There's a lot of um, challenges in the world that we're living in at the moment and having someone who is familiar to your client really helps them feel engaged and supported. Alrighty. I honestly believe that telehealth promotes client-centered care and supports informed decision-making. It's a really even power dynamic. It's very, very different to a client coming to your office, coming into your room and sitting across the table from you. They are very much in their space and they, the, the appointments feel incredibly different and it's really wonderful. Information, as I've mentioned a lot of times, can be shared prior to the appointment, which reduces the need for an education-focused approach. Booking systems can be managed by the client, empowering them to make a time that suits them and fits in with their other uh, responsibilities. And something else that you may like to consider is blocking your clinical hours to support your work-life balance. I have two small children at home and was homeschooling, so I was doing a lot of my consultations after hours, which was incredibly convenient for me, but also very loved by our clients. The other thing that's incredibly important is consent to genetic testing. We provide a video and text supported revision of the information which our clients can go through in their own time and then provide informed consent, saving time during your face-to-face -face sessions and also enabling a client to reflect on your conversation and ask any follow-up questions that they may have. All right. Ways to measure client satisfaction. As Sylvia mentioned, people love telehealth. The ways you can measure this are feedback surveys. These can be for the clients and also for the referring healthcare providers who may use your service. 
A net promoter score is a score that is a rating on a scale of one to 10. This measures the likelihood that the client would recommend your service they experienced to friends or family. We all know that genetics is deeply personal, but when offering tests like expanded carrier screening, you want to support the dissemination of those carrier statuses among family members. You can support this by knowing how your clients feel about your service and encouraging them with written information to help share that information with family members who are more likely to be carriers or at risk of inherited genetic conditions. It's really, really helpful to provide copies of educational materials and results to clients and to the referring doctors. We all know that there's a huge push to mainstream genomics, but we also know that each healthcare provider has their specialty and that's what they want to focus on. Having clinical genetic services that sit outside and complement these, um, whether it be obstetrics or IVF services, mean that there needs to be a seamless transition between the services. So ensuring that your uh, referring physicians, uh, probably who I'm speaking to today, you get information that is the same as your clients, helps you promote their decision making and con continuity of care. So in summary, I just want to quickly run through the benefits of telehealth. Obviously, um, for us, there's a, a timeliness to the access of appointments. It improves access enormously. One of my favourite stories is uh, Australia, as you all know, is very, very large. We have a huge number, uh, a huge proportion of our population which do not live in the main cities. We had a farmer dial in while on his tractor in Mildura, which is uh, certainly a potentially would have been a five hour drive for him while his wife was sitting in their home and talking to a genetic counsellor. It really, really improves access and we're really passionate that everyone everywhere should be able to access genetic counsellors regardless of where they live. Telehealth obviously reduces travel times. I know that travelling to and from appointments can be incredibly stressful. So while taking that stress away and empowering people to know what to expect, you're really, really able to empower that client to feel more at ease during their appointments. Telehealth does offer flexibility of practice, not only for genetic counsellors and physicians, but also for clients who are trying to balance a lot of things. It promotes autonomous decision-making. It increases your time with the patient. It really, really opens and facilitates openness of communication. It promotes an even power dynamic and obviously benefits, reduces face-to-face -face contact during a health pandemic. Um, I've lost a slide. All right, limitations. Um, so obviously the client's perceptions of appointments are altered. We've had to certainly cancel many an appointment taken at a cafe. The most unusual session we had was someone dialing in while they were having a manicure. That one was rescheduled as well. But it's really helpful just to acknowledge that people don't necessarily know what to expect. You also can't control the environment of your patient, but you can make recommendations. As Sylvia mentioned, and we all know, internet connectivity can certainly be very tricky. It's really important not to be um, stressed by it, but or you can always um, fall back on a good old um, landline if you need to. Obviously, telehealth requires a smartphone or another video enabled device and can require clients to download apps in advance. Services can also be incredibly limited for people with different abilities. People who don't speak the language that you do is a challenge, but you can dial in telehealth um, translators to your sessions, but we do find that these take much, much longer than you would expect. So you have to budget in the time for that. It's also more challenging for elderly clients to use technology. Although we did have a beautiful experience last week where an 80 year old gentleman dialed in for his proactive cancer risk test and he'd invited his daughter over for the day. She'd brought in the device and set him up and it was a beautiful opportunity for her to support her father as he went ahead with this test, which obviously the results had implications for her too. 
Cultural barriers are important to think about when it comes to telehealth genetic counselling and also acknowledging and making space for people who, who come from lower socioeconomic groups. So it would be remiss of me not to share some of the learnings that we um, have in our experience so far. And what we notice the most is that telehealth really changes the dynamic of genetic counselling and promotes patient autonomy. Most people are taking calls from home or trying to squeeze into private office spaces at work. But video uh, is a really important cue for the genetic counsellor. Couples feel comfortable in their own space, sometimes a little too comfortable, but it's, um, I think that's more important than them feeling like that they can't communicate openly with each other and with you. Convenient appointment times are really critical. Consistency of care is really, really important um, and correspondence is essential. The best thing about telehealth, in our opinion, is that clients feel empowered. Shared care can be really, really easy and ensuring that family communication is, is maintained and encouraged is also supported by the fact that we're in a digital world and information can be shared quite simply. So thank you all for your time. Hopefully we've got lots of time for questions, but if you do want to follow up with me, please feel free to email us at counsellors at eugenelabs.com. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zoe. Um, now we, we've probably got a minute, so we might just very quickly, there has been one question. Um, so is a specific and or additional consent form required for telehealth and how is this best managed? I don't know if either one of you would like to take that question. So, in the US, that is a state specific law. So like in California, if you're going to be seeing a patient under Medicaid, which is public health insurance, it is required that you at least get verbal consent from the patient before a telehealth visit. Um, some organizations just build it into their regular, tele, uh, regular patient consent. And basically telehealth consent involves language such as, you do realize you're getting this visit through a video conference. <laughs> and if, uh, their, if their technology can break down and our visit can be disconnected. So the things that don't happen on an in-person one, usually your doctor doesn't fall off the exam room. <laughs> so so it's, it's things that, and, and telling you that if this doesn't work for you, once you're on the visit, you can request to do an in-person visit or an alternate type of visit. So that's the type of language in a telehealth visit. It's more about the logistics of telehealth than, than anything else, because your regular patient consent consents them to give you services. Mm. And nothing to add there, Zoe, you, you find the same? Um, yeah, in general, we don't require um, consent. We do sometimes inform, inform clients that a session may be recorded um, and then we ask for their consent in advance and then again at the appointment check that they are still happy for, to do that. That can be incredibly helpful for training purposes if you've got a large team that you're needing to onboard to telehealth. Giving them an example can be really helpful but certainly consent is, is um, something that we think is really important. Fantastic. So just as we reach the top of the hour, this concludes the sixth session of the ISPD virtual education series. I'd really like to thank everybody for joining us today at, at various hours throughout the world and really give a very special thank you to our two guest speakers, Sylvia Mann and Zoe Milgram. It's been very informative, I think, in a year that has been um, challenging. And so it's, it's fantastic to have uh, other experts who can help us navigate this time. So the presentation was recorded and it will be available on the ISPD website. Certificates of attendance and CEUs will be available for the first six sessions of the virtual education series and you'll be sent an evaluation for the series and more information regarding claiming CEU, CEUs via email.
There will be an additional webinar presentation next week on Wednesday, the 18th of November, 2020 at 11 a.m. Eastern Time US. This session will be about the newly published ISPD position statement on cell-free DNA screening for Down syndrome in multiple pregnancies. Be sure to check the ISPD website for the link to register and for more information. So thank you very much, everybody, and have a good day or evening. Thank you. Thank you.